Hi, I'm Oliver Gao. I'm the director of Cornell System Engineering Program, and I have been conducting these system conversations with our distinguished speakers that come to talk in our Ezra System Seminar Series. So today, I'm very delighted and honored to have Professor Maria uh, Maroka, who joined North Carolina State University in August of 2013 as a Chancellor's Faculty Excellence Program Cluster Hire in Personalized Medicine. She is a professor in the Edward Pitts Department of Industry and Systems Engineering at a part of the Healthcare Systems Engineering Group. Her goal is to address fundamental research barriers in moving from estimates of efficacy to estimates of the effectiveness of inventions or policies by explicitly considering individual patient patients when the underlying patient population is heterogeneous. So welcome to our uh, conversation, Maria. It's it's very nice opportunity to talk to you. You know, I was reading your you know I have this whole uh, you know whole pile of your of your research and your your CV. I was really um, amazed by the work you have you have done. It's kind of, it's really I think cross disciplinary. Of course, before we get into the details of your research, I believe all of us would like to know more about yourself. You know your research. Your, you know like your your career and how. Because I know, like a lot of us, when we do our PhD study, we are usually tend to be very narrow, uh, dig deep. And how did you kind of emerge from your, you know, from your PhD study, and then now come up, you know, through this, come to this point of this very systems-oriented research where you are optimizing cross-disciplinary objects. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, actually for my PhD, uh, I did not start working in health systems. My PhD wow. um, was uh, related to supply chain and I was uh, working on uh, assortment problems. So the question there was, uh, well one of the questions was how do we create an assortment when you think about patient, uh, not patient, but consumer choice mm -hmm. and you're trying to maximize profit. So very different, but in my mind, what I saw that I really liked about my research was this idea of if I consider the consumer and their behavior, then I will have a different action as a decision maker in order to have an optimal system. Their optimal was in the sense of profit. But what if optimal is not in the sense of profit? So, so as soon as I finished my dissertation, I always really had this interest in healthcare. I think at the time, healthcare was a new area for people in industrial and systems engineering or operations research. So I started to think about how could we apply this to healthcare. And the patient is also just a consumer. And the patient is often faced with decisions. And so when I started to looking at, uh, re to me this is about resource allocation when you have a system under uncertainty with heterogeneous consumers. And in healthcare, the patient is the consumer. They are always heterogeneous because everyone has uh, different problems. And we try to make recommendations for healthcare, such as screening recommendations, right? And then when I started looking into the literature, I realized when they make a, they say something is optimal, oftentimes they assume people will follow the recommendations and that's what I mean by um, the difference between efficacy and effectiveness so efficacy means if I am how good does this drug work if I give it to you at, at treating you mm -hmm. effectiveness is when we put the drug on the market how well does it actually reduce the disease why would it be any different because people do not necessarily choose to even initiate the treatment, people may choose not to adhere to the treatment, and what if it's something you're supposed to take every day? Maybe you forget one day. Um, so then that's going to have an impact on how effective the drug is. So that's where I started. I started thinking about how do I combine um, these patient choice models into models for making decisions for healthcare. You say that you did not start you know, kind of uh, with research into health uh, system. However, in, I think that's actually, I think the beauty of the, you know, uh, fundamental PhD research, you pick up tools mm -hmm. uh, that can be used to study consumers, and then that can be easily transferable to study 
patients, as you pointed out, also are consumers. Mm-hmm. I think that, that's a beautiful point. And of course, I think you made such a, a beautiful kind of uh, transition to look at a you know, self health problem because I, I agree with you. And I think in this country, all over the world, health system is really you know, a key thing. I, I believe in this country, health care, you know, I think, costs about 17 or 18 percent of the national GDP every year. And I think if, if your work can help save just even 0.1%, mm-hmm. that's a huge uh, saving. So when you talk about this, so, and then that also reminds me of, I'm really impressed about you, you, you emphasize efficacy versus efficiency. That reminds me of electrical vehicles. You know, this technology has been there more than two decades. So it's like a drug, you know, in terms of, you know, it can, it can cure the society in terms of like kind of transported emissions. Assuming that our energy source is cleaner, however, why even today, like the penetration rate of EV mm-hmm. is still so low? It's like the you know the the patient doesn't not take the drug or does not take the drug as as they are instructed, yeah. right? So so in terms of that, so how did you come across any um, difficulty in transferring your expertise? to the study of health systems and patient care. So did yeah. you, you know, when you, you know, first transitioned from your previous study to the health care, so what, what were the major barriers and how did you overcome them? There are several things. First is I'm not an expert in, I don't have an MD degree. So to really understand what the problem is, I have to learn about the problem and I can't learn everything so I also have to find the right people to collaborate with to tell me about what are the important issues. So for example, I work on colorectal cancer screening uh, problems. Uh, why screening? Because actually the treatment for colorectal cancer is very clear. It works very well. And we actually know that screening works well. We don't need to design new screening treatments. We don't need to design new screening intervals. So if I was just looking at it from a, you know, from a mathematical point of view, I might start heading into the wrong, asking the wrong question, where it's already been proven that this is the right treatment. Just like you said, we have the we have the answer. People are not using it. So then, the goal has been: how do we create interventions that will incentivize individuals to use this treatment? And there is an interesting analogy to your electric vehicle um, analogy. Because even though we have a treatment, colonoscopy in this case, that is much better because if I, if I use this as a screening, it also becomes the treatment and then you're done for 10 years. It is very invasive and people don't like it. And so there had been recommendations for a very long time that doctors should be telling their patients to get a colonoscopy, but people are not doing it. But there's an at-home kit that you can do you can do it at home you mail it in the problem is you have to do it every year and it, it turns out that for some populations they pre, they very much prefer using this and in fact Canada has changed their recommendations to have this uh, uh, fecal test at home be now the recommended screening treatment so um, yes I, I I think the the one of the biggest challenges was I don't understand what the underlying health problems are and to understand them I I do need to learn a lot on my own but I can't learn all of it so I also have to find really good collaborators um, that can explain to me what the problems are and also if I come up with a solution I need to have them to say that sounds like a good implementable solution because when you're dealing with healthcare it's not like a retailer that they can change any knobs right they mm-hmm. can adjust the price and they can that's any kind of recommendation you can make might be a lot easier to implement than in healthcare where you might have constraints on the implementation side so you also have the challenge of it's not it's not enough to just come up with an optimal solution you have to come up with an implementable solution absolutely I, I really like your point it's, it's, it's not only optimal but also implement which is probably even more important because if something is optimal it's never get done versus something that's suboptimal but it's feasible mm-hmm. I think that's a very good point so uh, and also I think you, you mentioned a very key point of kind of uh, how 
you overcome all this difficulty, it's really kind of, you know, you're, you, you, you're open-minded and also you are learning and you're willing to collaborate with, you know, other people. This, you know, when, when you were talking, I was thinking, you know, nowadays, like, in you know, our education, our training, something, because we think, you know, to make our society or to make our professions to be more efficient, so our training is becoming more and more specialized. Mm -hmm. right? Because if, if people are specialized in something, they will be more efficiently doing what they're doing. However, on the other hand, the challenge that our society has, that, uh, that our societies have, are becoming more and more systems. Mm -hmm. So you can see that people train with specialty versus you know, the challenge that is kind of system in nature. So this reminded me, I was thinking, how for the future of our education? You know, what's your view about, for example, from your own experience? And here, especially here, we have this system and in our program, we also have a PhD uh, in systems. I just want to mention one point. When we started this PhD program, when we applied for this program, we intentionally dropped the word engineering. We say PhD in systems. Second, we open the door mm. for you know people with any background because we realized nowadays to address a lot of China, we have to think about human factors, mm -hmm. human centric solutions. So now coming back, you know, for our education of future, uh, you know, future training of future workforce and also education of future generations, how you know, from from your own experience, what should be our what should be our uh, education philosophy and our approach. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I sat on a uh, panel recently and I heard uh, someone describe that the right education system is as a T-shape, uh -huh. meaning that you go deep in one area, but you can't, that's not enough, you have to have the, the top layer where you learn a little bit about some everything else, so you have like a T-shaped education system. Uh, you know, the problem is fitting all of that in, how do you how do you fit all of that in? Uh, for a PhD program, I think one of the important things is to have somebody on the committee that has a contextual expertise. So for my students, I often have a medical collaborator. Thankfully at NC State, uh, anybody, in the U anybody at UNC or Duke can easily be counted as an outside committee member without too much paperwork. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to have a medical uh, person or if we have an ad, sometimes we have adjuncts. See, we have an adjunct from the Mayo Clinic, or we mm -hmm. have an adjunct uh, from another health system. They can become part of the students committee, and that's really important because um, you cannot have interdisciplinary like this, where I you tell me what the question is, and I say, okay, I'm going to go work on it, and I come back and I give you an answer because maybe I went in the very wrong direction. So you have to make sure that you're having these touch points continuously throughout so that you don't lose sight of the problem or go in the, in the wrong direction. And, and if somebody's on the committee, then they're continuously um, talking with the student. I also very much believe in soft skills and making sure that the students know how to present to a non-technical or even if a technical audience, an audience from a different discipline. Mm -hmm. You know, if I go in and talk to a medical doctor and I talk about OR, they're thinking operating room, I'm thinking oh. operations research. So I have to remember not to use these acronyms. I have to remember not to say um, objective, but to say goal. You know, you have to know how to talk to a different audience. And um, so for my students, I make them present to those individuals. I make them go to conferences that might be outside of INFORMS um, so that they get used to having to, to have that interaction. Um, and then, then if the person understands what you do, then they come to you with problems and that's, that's the funnest part of all. Then once, I often have people that I've collaborated with in the past and then they'll come back to me and they'll say, oh, um, I, I don't know exactly what you do, but I this is a systems problem, so I'm bringing it to you. But I know enough to know that this is a systems problem, so I'm bringing it to do, to you. What do you think? Uh, and so, but first they have to know a little bit about what you do, and you have to be able to communicate that. So this is one of you. You are really a systems person, 
Yeah, I, I really appreciate that because when you talk about this, you, you talk about uh, like uh, the T-shaped knowledge structure, and you talk about like the soft skills. You know, you know, I, I so much agree with you because I realize um, nowadays in engineering education, a lot of engineering programs, uh, you know, students are trained so well in solving equations, mm -hmm. in coding, but you know, unfortunately, their soft skills. Are really lacking, right? I think kind of, and of course, you know this. And the soft skills, uh, in part, also has to do with that horizontal bar mm -hmm. in the in the T structure. That's what you know. I, I really appreciate that. I think you know, given that you know our time is up, you know, I, I do want to poke into a little bit about the talk you are going to give today, uh, because you know apparently this is, you know, this is related to health, but I think it actually goes beyond health because you are looking at the pre-positioning. Uh, of disaster relief supplies using, uh, you know, this uh, robust uh, optimization. You know, with this topic, I want to ask a question uh, related to specific words. What, you know, why prepositioning? Mm. And two, robust. Mm -hmm. kind of, what do you mean by robust and how can we achieve robustness? Mm -hmm. So the first part about prepositioning, that is very important because once a disaster occurs, it's gonna take time to get essential items to individuals. And if they're not there in advance, then you're gonna have longer time suffering. And even a half day or a day can be a long time when there's no power, you don't have, a, you don't have food in your home, or the food went bad because the power went out. Uh, mm. You can't go buy food because you don't have cash and there's no power to use your credit card. Right. So um, so it's essential because of the timing. Also, it costs a lot less. One dollar used in prepositioning is seven dollars used post-disaster, is some of the estimates provided, wow. mm -hmm. um, I think, by the UN. So if we can do this, the problem is, and this is where robustness comes in, well, what if I put it in the path of the storm? The people are going to be here, so I should put it here. But then here comes the storm, and all the items I have are now damaged. So for robust optimization, what we want to do is um, create a plan that even though I have a lot of uncertainty, I will be able to um, mitigate the risk uh, in the best way possible. That's great. I think you know, I'll look forward you know, to a talk which is just in 15 minutes. So I think you know, we'll conclude our conversation. It's really great to talk to you. Thank you. Yes.